Okay, welcome to today's lecture, everyone, where we'll be talking about a very common strategy for working with students who have either behavioural or educational needs. And that is to implement what is known as, or usually, usually known as, an individual education plan or an individual behaviour plan. And as I said, it can also be a behaviour plan. Okay, now these are usually implemented with students who have special needs of some description. All students in a special needs centre or a education support centre, a behaviour centre, so on and so forth, will be on some type of individual education plan or behavioural plan. Now they do go by various different names and terminologies um, because I guess as with all industries, people just really like to change things up a little bit, but effectively they're basically the same. Um, people like to put more of a modern sounding uh, word in there. So maybe instead of individual education plan, you may have come across one that had an M in it. So it was an instead of an IEP, it's an individual education, uh, sorry, an IBP, it's an individual uh, behavior management plan, IBMP. Um, and there's various other ones all over the place. Now, the probably the most important thing to remember with these plans is that they are simply a differentiation tool. So it's a way in which you can provide the student with a level of service that is specifically addressed at meeting the needs of that individual student. In a typical classroom, in a general class where uh, you don't have students with a disability or disorder or there are only one or two, uh, what is known as an inclusive classroom, generally you will have maybe one or two students that are on some form of uh, either an IEP or an IBP. Now, for those one or two students, they can quite often be, let's say an average primary school class, it will be the teacher, sometimes in combination with a deputy or the person above them, will put the student on some type of plan. And sometimes that plan will be used as the um, uh, for funding reasons, for government funding reasons, because all students who, uh, generally speaking, depending on where you are and the government that's in charge and the government of the day, um, students will be required to be on an, an, uh, an IEP or an IBP in order to receive funding or as a part of that funding process, that application process. Sometimes that involves or um, is contributed to by psychologists, by parents, by medical practitioners and so on and so forth. But um, at its very core, an IEP or an IBP is a strategy used to address the needs of an individual student, particularly when those needs aren't met by simply going about and doing the day-to-day -day teaching that you would normally do for the majority of students. Now, um, there are a few common aspects to IEPs and IBPs that if you've seen any of them or if you've got a child who's on an IEP or an IBP or any other similarly named program or process or system, you would notice that there are some similar aspects to them. And at their core, they're all pretty much the same because they all have one main thing in common. Well, a couple of main things in common. And this is what that is. At the beginning, there is a reason for why this particular student, because ed individual education plans or behaviour plans are individual, right? So they're made for individual students. Now that doesn't mean that um, student A is going to have a completely different program to student B, but it does mean that they are tailored to the needs of individual students. And if you um, 
do IEPs or IBPs regularly, uh, then of course um, there will be significant overlap. And the more of them that you do, the more that uh, the more easier that they become. And just as a little side note, by the way, IEPs or IBPs, there are heaps of uh, different ways of doing it. There's no right way or wrong way. Uh, at a bare minimum, an IEP or an IEP will be a single page. And I actually prefer to see plans and programs that are more user-friendly, that are simple, that are easy to follow. One page is probably a bit minimalist. It'd be more like three or four pages, um, maybe two, that really just sets out at least at the start, what the student needs are, what the goals are, whether it's your goals as a teacher or teacher aide or trainer or whoever, and how you're going to go about doing it. So how specifically you're going to go about meeting those goals, what strategies are going to be um, put in place. So at the core, there are lots of different ways you can do it. I recommend the simple ways. The same with lesson plans, if you see my videos on lesson plans and planning courses and programs and things like that. The templates are usually so complicated that it's just ridiculous. And sure, if we all, in an ideal world, if we had millions of hours from which we could sit around doing this stuff, then maybe we'd be able to use these overly complicated programs for students. But uh, in the real world, teachers are very, very busy. And the same with teacher aides and the other people that are working as a part of that education team. So my advice is to keep them as simple as possible. Because as a teacher myself, I can Definitely say that, yes, IEPs and IBPs are important and play an important role. Part of the most part of the process and why they're so effective is because of that developmental process of actually putting one into place. And once it's into place, sometimes it doesn't even get touched or looked at that often. And that's not necessarily best practice, but the reason for that is twofold. One, sometimes they're made in a way that is just way too complicated and obtuse and difficult to use. And two, that just makes it completely impractical. And two, because the actual process of making it uh, and uh, thinking through the different steps and goals and strategies is all that's really needed. And then it's just an occasional review there afterwards. Although sometimes, particularly on the education side of it, sometimes the um, programs actually go beyond being uh, really an IEP and beca start becoming a programming type uh, plan in which the teacher aides and teachers refer to regularly to be able to deliver content to students. But that's moving away from being a larger sort of system or plan and more towards being um, an actual curriculum based uh, document that is specifically designed for that one student. So I think uh, there is that fine line uh, between having this overarching sort of plan uh, and then having an actual course designed specifically for that one student. But um, really at the end of the day, these IEPs and IBPs, you can combine them together, although usually they're very separate noting the overlap because the research does show that there is a significant overlap because, uh, between the instructional design elements or your education plan and the um, behavior manage management processes and systems and techniques that you've got in place. So there is that significant overlap. If you've got really good behavior management techniques but your curriculum is really crappy, then you're going to have really poor behavioural outcomes, particularly with students with special needs. On the other hand, if you've got a really good curriculum but you don't have the best behaviour management processes and systems in place, then the same applies. Um, you're going to have difficulties with one. So they kind of do uh, work with each other and play into each other quite a lot. Um, but anyway, the point is keep them super simple, keep them user friendly, and just remember that they are tools to help guide you in delivering better outcomes for students. They're not there, well, they are there as funding devices and for bureaucratic reasons, but they are ultimately there. They're supposed to help you and they're supposed to help other people who come into the room um, and so on and so forth. So basically, all of those type of planning documents cover this individual student need process to begin with and that flows through right down to the strategies that we use here. So you start with saying, okay, this student has a particular need and that need is goes beyond what the teacher or teacher aide can do. It means that they need a specific set of strategies for those students. It's not, as I was saying before, it's not what they can do, but what they can do uh, without having to think through and put these strategies into place so that all team members 
uh, other teacher aides and teachers are also working to the same playbook or singing to the same tune, I guess you could say. Um, because these are put in place not for every single student and not even for every student who has behavioral or education issues, but they get to a point where the, the education professionals, whoever they are, whether it's teachers, whether it's teacher aides, coaches, trainers in the adult sector, decide that this particular student needs their own individual-based uh, plan to be able to address these needs. So there is that, I guess there's that cutoff. But anyway, so this, oh, and by the way, just one other little thing. In the adult sector, um, we still have IEPs and IBP, not so much IBPs, but IEPs, but they're just called various different things like a support plan or we call it a learning and support plan, but it can also be anything along those lines. Uh, we technically call ours, if you're doing any courses with us, we call it a SAP, support and assessment plan. But anyway, so now, uh, the student need needs to be very clearly identified. It can be a behavioral need. It can be an educational need. Again, always use those SMART goals that I always talk about. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time. So um, just make sure that you're hitting all those SMART goals while you're developing these because there's nothing worse. I was actually just quickly did a bit of a five minute Google before I started filming this and I was trying to find some examples. And I, a lot, I noticed, and this always irks me so much, is when people create these things or any other thing in the education sector and they're creating a template from a bureaucratic perspective, um, but they're not actually the ones that are having to implement it. And what happens is that they have all these really abstract and difficult to use, I wouldn't call them political, but um, more higher order ideological type needs in them. And, and, and I think, anyway, so the point is, just make sure your goals are ultra specific. And let me give you an example of that. I'd, uh, also, I've done a lot of behavior management videos which um, covers a lot of specific goals in developing systems and processes and things as well. So um, watch those because I think that really plays into this, and feeds into this type of stuff a lot. So for example, if a student is Let's say a simple example. Okay, so if a student is having a meltdown, so if you have a student who has autism and they're having a meltdown, say, I don't know, three times a week, now your goal might be to reduce that to goal equals one times a week, say. So I like to be ultra specific with my goals and ultra specific with what we're trying to actually uh, achieve. I see, I, I guess the example I'd used before is that some of the goals that I see um, are things like teamwork or improve their social skills and so on. And I just think like, that's such a broad and bureaucratic way of thinking that's clearly not being written by someone who actually works in an actual school with actual students. Because people who work with actual students um, can specify quite clearly straight away what the specific problems are that we're trying to solve. And Quite often, if you say we're working with a student that uh, has autism, meltdown is probably one of them. Another one is um, doing a, what they call a runner. So they're running away, just call that a runner, doing a runner. Um, and that happens quite regularly with students after they've had a meltdown or before, or sometimes to prevent having a meltdown. So um, that's an escape mechanism by which students are making the decision that for whatever sensory reason or overload reason or um, something is stressing them out and making them anxious that they leave the school and run away. When I used to teach um, uh, primary school, I used to see this a lot. There was um, We had quite a lot of uh, different kids in the various different year groups. I used to teach all different year groups um, and doing a runner was pretty common. Maybe, um, maybe once a fortnight per child type of thing. And these days we've got a lot of other strategies that we use um, to help um, support students and uh, try and reduce that from happening. But at that point, there was no IBP um, in place for those students. Uh, they did work one-on-one -on -one with um, a teacher aide. And of course, these days, teacher aides are properly trained, but 15 years ago, there was no training. It was just the, as we call the mum's brigade. Um, so you just have a mum who was associated with a school for, usually they had a child at the school and they would be employed. At some point they would be yeah, asked if they wanted to work in the school and employed, but, uh, and they would work in the class and help the student out and so on and so forth. But we do know and the research is quite clear that teacher aides 
are actually have a negative effect on student learning if they're not trained properly. And there's a ra there's a range of reasons for that. One of the reasons is because of the teaching strategies and things that you think would actually um, uh, the natural inclination and the way that we treat people sometimes has the opposite effect, like giving students a reward after they've run away, you're trying to entice them back with other rewards like playing a video game or going to the library or whatever, but that, that actually has the effect of reinforcing the reward that comes with running away. So now uh, when we train teacher aides, when they're properly trained uh, with in organisations who know what they're doing, um, they they, uh, those types of things are integrated into that training, particularly into the behavior management um, side of things. And there are other reasons why teacher aides are not effective in schools if they're not trained properly. So uh, I speak a lot about the difference between concept understanding uh, and task completion. So uh, that basically means that you're teaching to the concept, not teaching with the goal of completing the five questions or 10 questions. So at the end you can say, yeah, I've completed all 10 questions or the child I'm working with has completed all 10 questions. They don't have a clue what's going on and they wouldn't be able to replicate that with different inputs, but they've completed it. So that's another reason. Uh, a third reason off the top of my head, and there's about five or six uh, known different reasons, is that uh, the teacher aide is working with these children in this particular class, usually the ones that need the most amount of help. The teacher then makes the assumption that that student is getting the help they're needed, uh, which actually usually quite often is not, um, not actually happening. So, um, and that's because that teacher aide may lack or not have the pedagogical knowledge to be able to support students in that in the right way. So they're not taking into account, for example, the root causes of their behavior. So if they're doing a runner, it's not that they're just being naughty, it's that they're trying to escape from something and therefore we need to either remove the need for them to feel that they need to escape or put other rewards in place as opposed to not being in that particular location. Are there other rewards that we can use? Uh, or it's those pure teaching and learning strategies that the person who is untrained uh, will not have. So it can be, for example, using metacognitive skills, uh, so teaching process, teaching the processes behind things, how to um, chunk things down into small steps, how to use scaffolding, guided reading, shared learning, so on and so forth. So, um, And that's not just to say that is with teachers, uh, uh, with teacher aides, that also happens with teachers as well. There are quite a lot of teachers because uh, who don't have that pedagogical knowledge because at university level uh, you might learn, I don't know, 10 or 15 strategies if you're lucky, um, whereas in my book I outline over 100 of them. Actually, I'll probably more so go through 120, 130 because there are a lot of them out there. Um, and the same with behavior management. There are hundreds of them out there and a lot of the university courses just don't even teach behavior management. They teach it in such an abstract kind of higher so almost like a political sort of way, in my opinion. But anyway, so um, the point is to make sure that your individual education plans and your behavior plans are super practical, that you can use them, that the teacher can use them, the teacher aide can use them, whoever else is in that class um, can use them, particularly if someone's away and they're being replaced by a temp or relief person as well. So anyway, we got off track a little bit there, but that's okay. So the most important thing is to bear in mind, yes, that it's practical, and yes, that you're thinking of those specific goals, specific goals that are also measurable. So that basically means using numbers and not being too bureaucratic and higher order about it. But uh, that's probably just my personal opinion anyway. You can have that stuff in there, um, but uh, you need something that you can work on now, something that you can work on tomorrow. So if the student's in class tomorrow, how can you better serve the needs of that particular student? That's how I see it anyway. So that's what the student needs are. Now you'll be able to divide their needs up into three or four different um, sections. So if we're talking purely from an education perspective, it may be a case that you've got maths and you've got um, say reading and you've got science and you've got phys ed, right? So you're looking at their needs from a bare bones, not a bare bones, but uh, from a topical sort of perspective and you're saying with maths, okay, what specifically um, do we need help with? And that means that you're looking at where they're at um, and or, uh, yeah, where they're at and then with the goals is specifically where you would want them to be. So for all of these different things, you're specifying where they are, what I like to call point A, and where you want them to be, what I like to call point B. So at, um, say, reading, they may be reading at level two. You want them to be able to read 
at level three by the end of the year. So you're just being as specific as you possibly can um, with each of these different topics. From a behavior management point of view, um, generally your IBP will literally state the five or six things that are driving everyone crazy. So it might be the um, meltdowns, it might be the fact that the student is swearing at staff, or there are usually four or five outstanding behaviors that, um, uh, that cause that student to be on a behavior management plan. Now, quite often the, or an individual behavior plan. Now, um, not all students who have special needs are on these types of plans, particularly the behavior ones. So going with the, uh, the um, ASD or autism um, scenario that we were talking about before, sometimes those students are working with, um, uh, are working in a classroom, in a general classroom, and don't need to be on them because a little bit of differentiation, a little bit of differentiation is all that is needed. Um, so I wouldn't make the assumption that all students with special needs are on these, although it is very common. Okay, so basically that's what we mean by student needs, um, and I recommend being ultra specific so that because if you're not ultra specific, how are you going to set goals? So, okay, now under the goals section, um, we're then doing what we were doing here. So we're saying we're at level two at the moment and we want to get level three. Or we're at, from a meltdown perspective, that's happening three times a week and we wanna get that down over here to goals. We wanna get that down to one times per week on average or one times per fortnight. Now, that means that you can not only be specific, but you can also measure it to decide that if these strategies have actually been effective because Otherwise, it's a never-ending thing. That might get down to once a term and um, you would never actually then realize that it's been effective because in your mind, it's still happening even though it's happening instead of 30 times in a term, it's actually only having one time in a term. So you've gotten that down to 3% or so of the original amount of time that it's happening. So it's reduced by 97% thereabouts, if my maths is correct, but yet in your mind, you might still be thinking that it hasn't been effective because the behavior is still re reoccurring. So it's important to make sure that it's definitely measurable. Obviously it has to be achievable, so that's obviously another thing. And you've got a specific amount of time in which those things are hopefully going to happen. So you've got some idea of, obviously that can be flexible as well because if they may achieve it, they may not within that uh, specific period of time. Now under strategies, Depending on whether we're talking about uh, behavior or the education side of things, you're going to have various different strategies. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that because I've done dozens and dozens and dozens of videos on behavior. So I'd just go watch those and you'll see um, all the different strategies there. Or you can just read my book. And the same with the education side of it. Uh, I've, there are literally hundreds of different strategies that could be put in place there. And it's not just a case of putting those strategies in place. Uh, it's not just a case of choosing those strategies and then implementing them. It's also thinking about how they interact with each other because, for example, if your behavior management strategy um, for a student who has a meltdown is having um, visual cards, visual cards, right, and, and having an alternative reward, so replace reward. So basically what that means is if the student is feeling very anxious and they know that they're about to have a meltdown, then you've got some visual cards that they can use. They can just show you, um, particularly if they're not very uh, verbal. Um, and then that means that there is some type of reward system. Well, not a reward system, but the reward over here, in the past, the student was seeking, the reward they were seeking was that they got out of class. So they got to escape that particular situation that they were having problems with that was making them anxious. So you're replacing that reward, um, that's just the terminology that we use, you're replacing that reward with an alternative reward, um, which is, well, it can be, for example, they can read a book in the back corner, they might be able to play a video game. So when I was teaching year nines, the student I had in that class um, that I'm thinking about, I've taught year nines quite a lot, but for this particular student, they were able to play video games. They had a just a simple game console that they were allowed to play for 10 or 15 minutes just to reduce that anxiety level quite substantially. Obviously, you need to put some thought into how you make sure that um, that isn't, I guess, uh, abused in a sense that the student is giving you the card every five minutes. But 
Over time, you can see that that reward has been, you're replacing the escape with the, a separate reward, which is to, I guess they're still escaping in a way, but they're doing it in a way that is more acceptable and that's not gonna cause problems. Because if students are running away, or having a meltdown, obviously there are safety issues involved there. If they do run away, then someone has to follow the student to make sure they're not gonna get run over and all this kind of stuff. And usually it takes up quite a lot of time um, and is quite stressful. So, um, and that's one of the reasons why there are specific programs in a lot of areas now for students with uh, certain types of disabilities and disorders. So there are pro autism programs. I think they're called, I think it's called autism. Yeah, autism programs. Um, for students who have that particular disability or disorder in this case, uh, so that staff can be trained in, um, well, in this case, it's called ABA, uh, which is Applied Behavioural Analysis. And during Applied Behavioural Analysis, what the staff are doing is going through and figuring out what the reward is or what is known as a trigger. So before the meltdown happens, there'll be a trigger. Uh, and quite often that's not obvious. So it could be any type of sensory thing and um, that could be a change in the weather. It could be the volume of the class gets too loud or whatever, but it could be a certain just feeling frustration. It can be blood sugar levels because bear in mind that I think it's about 70% of students who have autism uh, also have another disability or disorder, whether it's ADHD or diabetes or um, hearing impairment or something like that. That goes, that's also called a co- uh, I don't know if that's technically called a comorbidity, but it's definitely multiple disabilities is very common. So that's why working with multiple disabilities, uh, working with any student with a disability is quite complex because um, more often than not, they don't have one disability, they have multiple disabilities. And so um, they, and those two different disabilities and the signs and symptoms and characteristics of those two different uh, disabilities affect that student and their behavior and their education in various different ways. Anyway, so that that is the basics of uh, just that simple idea behind behavior and some of the ways in which you can identify a need, a specific goal, uh, and a strategy uh, as it applies to students with autism um, and uh, so on. But obviously in an education uh, sort of, so that's for behavior. Uh, in an education sense, we were talking about, say reading here, getting from level two to level three. Um, and the strategies there are, well, there's a millions of them. Obviously, one-on-one -on -one instruction, it could be remedial, some type of remedial uh, program or intervention strategy. It can be just a multimodal uh, sort of attempt. It can be where you're using lots of different modes of, uh, so you're using a book, you're using a, a TV show, a blog, all this kind of stuff to try and get them to become more engaged and motivated um, to uh, read outside of class and uh, and so forth. Then the other thing you can do, talking about rewards, is that for, say, this particular student where we're having problems with meltdowns and um, doing a runner, uh, we can um, then offer some type of reward to the student if they're getting that down to one per fortnight or one per week. Again, if it's measurable and if it's achievable um, and it's realistic and there's some time base to it, so it's like by this time here, the end of the term or whatever it is, we can get that down to that, then there's some additional reward. You can choose a movie, we can go to the cinema and whatever, or you can order, I don't know, Chinese for lunch or something like that. So you set out some specific rewards in the uh, individual uh, behavior plan or education plan. Uh, that's another way to uh, go about, I guess, motivating students. Okay, so I'm just gonna rub all of this off because I need a little bit of room for the next bit. Now, there are certain, so that, that, that there gives us the overall, I guess, view of the purpose of an IEP or an IEP and the main aspect of it, the main, I'm not, I don't wanna say ideological, but the sort of the main philosophy behind IEPs and IBPs, and that is to identify what the problem is um, what we want to achieve and then how we're going about doing it. And then I guess there's a bit of a loop there, right? Like a bit of a feedback loop because you do one IEP, put it in place, things won't work and change it around, yada, 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 make amendments to it and sort of start again. And that process just keeps continuing. So it's like a, continually, a continual sort of improvement uh, process there. We do say that IBPs and IEPs are dynamic 
iterative documents. And by dynamic, we means that they're const and, and iterative means that they're constantly changing and they're constantly being uh, updated and amended. And uh, there's there's built into the system is this need for constant review and change because uh, once you start doing a new uh, uh, doing some new strategies here to address the problem, you may find that one or two work really well uh, and one or two don't. So then you go through that review process. Okay, so let's move on. And we'll use a different pen just for fun, which will be red. No, let's do orange. Okay, now I just wanted to quickly cover some of the basic sections that you'll find in these IEPs or IBPs because uh, you will come across uh, very complex and difficult to use um, plans called by various different called various different things. And when you are looking at those, just go through and scan over it and think, okay, what is going on here? What part of those three, four things that I just had on the board? What part of that is that is that addressing? Is that particular section addressing? So my advice, if you don't have a template or you're not forced to use a particular template, I would develop your own. I like developing all my own templates. I put some basic ones in the um, teaching strategies book, which you can always have a look at. Uh, but I prefer just to go into Word and just smash out my own template. And if I'm using it all the time, I might spend a little bit more time on it. It doesn't take very long to develop something uh, along these lines. And then you can tailor it to what you want, and what works for you. So um, anyway, there are a few sections in every single, pretty much every single, IEP or IBP. So first one is details. Now, um, again, if you just write IEP across the top, then underneath that you're going to have a series of details and that can be your name, the name of the other people involved, whether it's teachers and their role, teachers, teacher aides, parents, psychologists, other medical specialists, uh, literacy specialists, behaviour specialists, so on and so forth. So um, the manager, the senior manager or principal, they may be involved to some point in the approval process or in the meetings that happen when you're trying to develop these IEPs or IBPs. So either way, you've got all those details, right? And included in that might be the dates. So your IEP uh, might go for six months, it might go for three months, it might just be a, um, we're going to try this for us, all of 2000 and insert date here, um, or it might only go for a shorter period of time with, it might be open-ended, so there's no sunset clause, but it's also got review, regular review dates. So however you want to set out details, uh, it really doesn't matter, it just needs to identify clearly that it's for this individual student. Now, I always like to put a purpose in there, so a single line that just says um, the reason they're on an IBP or an IEP in one sentence, sum up the reason for that. Okay, so the other thing that they normally have in there, so outside the basic details is interests. Um, and Interest is a really important one. That's one where you need to get the student involved or parents involved because a lot of the curriculum and the rewards and the resources that you use and things like that can really feed back to that. So you might, well, feed from that because you might be surprised that uh, you never find out that students have particular interests. They just don't tell you or that you might get halfway through the year before you realise that they're absolutely obsessed with I don't know, gardening or something like that. So it's important to try and tease that out a little bit and spend a bit of time thinking about that, working with parents and so forth to figure out what students' interests are because I think that that one is quite important. There's also like a, let's call that medical. So you'd have a section about the medical needs of the student, whether they're diagnosed, undiagnosed. One of the biggest problem, no, not the biggest problem, but a problem that you'll come across quite regularly is the fact that a lot of students do not have a diagnosis or they have not been diagnosed for various different reasons. Sometimes parents don't like to have their uh, kids diagnosed because then they will uh, get attached with a label and things. Other times the students uh, or the student, particularly with autism, the student might not reach the required level to be formally diagnosed with autism, uh, even though quite clearly they have very strong traits of autism in certain section in certain in certain ways. So um, anyway, outlining all that kind of stuff is important. It might be a case that you uh, add in there whether they're on certain types of drugs or medicines or whatever. 
um, treatments that they're going to, how often they see their doctor, if they have to take a day off uh, every now and then, once a month or something like that. So anything to do with medical uh, or formal diagnosis or even uh, undiagnosed conditions uh, is worth putting into that section. And that's why these sections here, or just in general, the whole plan uh, is worth, it is worth your time to go through and meet with uh, parents or caregivers or whoever to find out as much information as you possibly can because it, it really does make a big difference as you go through and develop these. Now, if you're working as a uh, teacher aid, teacher assistant, learning support officer, school support officer, integration aid, paraprofessional, any of those other terminologies, they all basically mean the same thing. If you're working uh, in that sort of area, then you can either develop basic ones of these yourself if you're allowed to, particularly, particularly if you've been in the school for a while and the teacher allows you to go and do that and, um, and particularly if you're working as that lead sort of role because you've quite often got the entry level, you've got those that work with special needs and then you've got those lead, um, uh, well, quite often they're either called lead EAs for education assistant or lead or group leader or things like that. So if you're working or you've got your own program that you're running, in rural schools, for example, we see a lot of teacher aides running their own literacy program for Indigenous students or whatnot. Um, now, yeah, number four, number five, number six. Uh, anyway, so yeah, point is working with parents to find that out is, and to really get that down pat, you may not always be able to do that, um, but that really does have uh, quite a lot of advantages. Now, the next one that I like to set out, or for me personally, again, you can move it around and do it in various different ways, it doesn't really matter, is you've obviously got, say, uh, needs. Okay, and that particular section there, or, yeah, needs slash challenges. Yeah, um, that's, I guess, the politically correct way of saying what the problem is. Now, these for this section here, this is going to be quite a meaty section because you need to outline, um, if, it's an if it's an education plan, then you're going through and having, say, one section, a quarter of a page or whatever, on each of the different topics for that particular student. So if they're doing math, science, English, whatever, um, you need to have a specific section uh, on each of those. Now you could have an IEP just for say maths or an IEP just for reading, but I, I probably wouldn't do that. And I think the majority of them generally focus on the entire um, spectrum or the, all the topics and all the subjects for a particular student. That's the most common way to go about doing that. Uh, if it's a behavioral thing, um, then it'll just be a case of going through and outlining the five main issues. And you might decide that you've got some four or five that are really important or three or whatever, and then have something along the lines of secondary uh, behavioral issues as well. So whatever you want to call that section, it doesn't really matter. I think in the book, the example that I use uh, is that you, you're, I actually think I, yeah, that section is just more of a, a little summary, but I'd probably do it in a bit more, um, depth than that, uh, particularly if you've got a lot of information about that student. And just on that, it's usually around week three to four of a course or program or term that the teacher slash teacher aides will start looking at developing those unless they know the student from the term or year before. And that's because you need to get to know the student a little bit to do some diagnostic or other types of formative assessments uh, before you can start developing and putting that plan together, sometimes a little bit earlier, but um, it's very difficult to do these if you don't know the student. Okay, so you've got the needs or challenges and that can be uh, yeah, relatively, again, I wouldn't go into too much detail there because you can develop the program in about week three or four, your plan, and then after that, you can then uh, start focusing more and more heavily on certain areas or adding more and more detail as you need to. So now number five is your goals. And sometimes combining number five and number four um, can happen. I have seen some IEPs where they've done it on a big sort of A3 piece of paper or where you start and you've got the need here and then the associated goal. And then on the other side of that, you've then got the strategies almost like I drew uh, before, so they sort of match each other, as in you'll have need, no. you'll have need, 
and then you list them here, sort it on a table. No, let's actually draw a table. So let's say you have a table, you'll have need. That one's running out. And then you'll have goal. And then this last one is your strategies. It's going to be the messiest table ever. That's all right. And then over here, we might even have um, responsibility and time or something like that. So there's a few other columns that you could add in. Whatever works for you. Um, and down here, this need bit might be, oh, let's, if you were doing EP, you might have a topic and it might be reading, writing, uh, social skills, which is getting more into the behavior thing, but, oh, well, that's fine. They do overlap. Reading, writing, social skills. Um, you might do science. And let's just add in cooking just for fun, right? Okay, cool. So you can see how you can quite easily do it in a little bit of a table. I've never done it in that way, but um, actually now that I've drawn it up as a big table, it does seem like having that single graphic uh, that you can pull out and refer to uh, would be quite... Uh, would not be a bad way to go. And of course, you could have specific strategies here. You might have three goals, two goals, whatever. Okay, so anyway, point is we're talking about goals and using those SMART goals, which I've since uh, rubbed off the board, but those goals do need to be specific. So you need to be able to look at them and look at them or get another person, an independent person to look at it and go, well, yes, we have achieved these goals. Yes, that's been achieved. Yes, that's been achieved. Yes, that's been achieved. Yes, that's been achieved. Um, so make sure that they're not too sort of abstract or difficult to, to um, clearly prove that you've met those strategies. And again, that makes it a little bit accountable for you as well and for the people that are working with this within this sort of framework um, to make sure that they're doing their job and to make sure that the strategies are being implemented and that they're being implemented properly um, and so on. So... Okay, that's the goals. Uh, you might have a rewards type section um, and there's like a review section. Yeah, so you could have a reward section. So there might be some type of uh, individual version of a token economy um, that's being used where if the student can collect up points or something um, or it might be uh, regular... I guess excursions, as I was saying before, where once a month the student can choose to do a certain activity or whatever. So there's various different things that you could write in about that, um, whether they're intrinsic reward. Well, mostly they'll be extrinsic rewards in this kind of case. Um, and reviews, uh, I think that's an important section to put in there. So you just clearly identify and state that at this particular point in time, we're going to formally have a little bit of a meeting and go through um, and have a look at our IEPs and IBPs. So that's pretty much everything I've got to say about that one. Um, in summary, um, first thing I'll say is they go by various different names. Don't be confused about them. They all really do the same thing and that's identify the need, identify what the, therefore the goals are and then identify what the strategies are and then there's a bit of a feedback loop because those strategies may or may not work and then again, if some do work and you reduce the behavioural issues or reduce the need for those education strategies um, to continue to such a level of intensity, then um, there are obviously going to be continual changes there. So the IEPs and IBPs are iterative and dynamic documents that are regularly reviewed and changed. Uh, don't try and make them too complicated. Uh, I would recommend using your own or developing your own, although there are probably some good ones out there. I don't know. I haven't... Um, haven't had to make one of these for years. So um, the main sections, of course, are the details, the interests of the student, which is very important in developing rewards and in developing um, the strategies, in particular the curriculum and the type of resources that are used because if you can motivate students to engage in materials that are of interest to them, then they're less likely to misbehave, misbehave uh, and they have that existing schema from which they're able to draw knowledge from and draw a context from and draw skills from to be able to apply more easily, learn and apply new knowledge. So, um, you know, if they're into dinosaurs and you're doing maths, 
then um, you can somehow sort of try and relate those two things together to make it a little bit more interesting for the student. Uh, obviously, putting down as much information from a medical perspective as you possibly can because that will affect, for example, the root causes of the behavior. So um, we were talking before about students running away. Obviously, the root cause of that can be uh, sort of based on the fact that they have a disability um, and the root cause is really that sensory issue, some type of trigger, triggering event is happening there that is causing them to feel the need to escape that particular environment. And um, I've done a really uh, comprehensive video on the root causes and identifying root causes and um, so on and so forth. So uh, I would watch that because that's really important. If you don't know or haven't uh, learnt about the root causes of behaviour as opposed to those surface causes, um, then I highly recommend that because it's very, very important. Okay, so um, I can't remember where we're up to. Needs? Yeah, so it includes the needs. Obviously, from those needs, you need to have very specific SMART goals uh, and rewards and review in place. That review is more of a bureaucratic sort of process, but it is a good process to regularly look at and consider whether your ideas that you had in week three or four are still relevant and whether you can change it up and do something different or whether you're going to continue with it um, as it is. Bearing in mind that from a behavioral perspective, uh, you're not going to eradicate all uh, issues in one go. In fact, you should never aim to completely eradicate all issues. What is known, we we're talking about ABA before and that type of program, it's known as extinction. So completely removing all negative behaviors or or all negative behaviors for a specific thing. So running away, you want to extinct, make extinct that type of behavior. It's just not really, um, it's not always possible to aim for that because then remember those SMART goals, one of them was realistic. Um, it's not really gonna happen. So that wouldn't uh, be something to write in as a goal, eradicate this behavior if it's very unlikely to ever happen. Um, so that's pretty much everything as far as IEPs and IBPs. I hope that is useful and helpful and uh, good luck with everything.